all right? I've got a little voice. Um, well, thanks for having me. I've been going to the IoT meetup since the beginning, and it's a lot more chilled out than this. This feels quite formal. So I hope you don't mind my kind of ramble of uh, things about open data. So I'm Jessie Baker. I'm a designer, and I'm also an engineer. It's nice to be at Arup, because that was my first job as an engineer 10 years ago. It was upstairs in the building group. Well, across the road, actually. Um, so yeah, and yes, so I'm here to present um, Providence, which is a very new business that we've just set up, and we're based at the Open Data Institute, and Matt over here is also in the team, <laughs> journalist by trade. Um, cool, so yeah, us two, along with a bit of a motley crew of developers and designers, are um, just kind of <coughs> casually trying to save the world. So um, we've got a thing, a problem we're trying to solve. We're, we're at the start of a journey, and that's kind of why I wanted to come here to discuss with you, because I think... IoT and kind of machine to machine comms is an, an integral part of that journey actually. Um, we're at a very early stage, but we're trying to solve a very specific problem. So just want to ask you, just want to do a bit of a show of hands really. Um, the problem we're trying to solve is about choices. So I'm going to do a quick social awareness survey. Um, how many of you would actively support um, slavery? Anyone? No, thank you. Good person. Good. Right crowd. Um, how many of you know for a fact you aren't wearing something that was made by a slave? Any of you know 100% that what you're wearing, the t-shirt you're wearing, was not made by a slave? No? Not many people. That's pretty bad. Um, so, not even me. <laughs> um, um, so, how many people, um, how many of you know how to find out if something you're bu about to buy is made by a slave. Any of you know if there's any way you can go and find out about that kind of stuff? Yeah, a few, good. Can I see a few people are interested? Um, and would you like a clear choice to buy something made by a slave or not? So would you like to be able to say, not slave, yes slave? Yeah? Cool. Okay, sweet. All right, awesome. Because this is quite central to the problem we're trying to solve. It's about choices, basically. Um, so it's about, it's, it's about social choices, but it's also about um, how our choices affect the environment as well. Um, which is something I really kind of wanted to bring in too, because often people think we're, we're just about the kind of social side. So everything comes to the ground, and everything was made by someone somewhere, probably, or a robot. Um, even the goop that goes into your 3D printer at some point has a, you know, come from something. Um, even products that go into circular consumption, even with an increase in recycling and invention of smarter materials, it's kind of easy to forget that the world is finite, stuff comes from the ground or is grown. So the issue we're really, really trying to solve is um, our kind of, we are kind of blind to our personal impact on the wider environment and on society. You know, every day we make choices to buy stuff, basically, and we don't really know what those uh, choices are actually affecting. Perhaps we're buying into something we really disagree with, perhaps we're not. The trouble is, you can only really choose from what you're presented with, right? And most of the time we're presented with stuff like this, and it's kind of hard to tell whether, uh, you know, what's good, what's bad. This certainly hasn't helped, all of these different symbols that are trying to kind of make us think, oh, yeah, this is a green thing, this isn't a green thing. Yeah, and you know, the independent seal has risen in a way to kind of replace um, brands as a mark of trust, but is it really going to be successful? Like, how do you know which uh, seal is better than any other? So, we thought, basically, you know, the internet should really be saving the day on this, right? Because isn't it going to help us make better decisions? In theory. Um, luckily we think so, and we hope you do too, because yeah, complexity has increased. Globalisation has increased the overall complexity of production, there's no doubt about that. You know, where our products come from is a hugely global, intricate issue, but the internet has enhanced our global interconnectivity as well. So what's that really got to do with the Internet of Things? Well, the Internet of Things will in even further enhance our interconnectivity. So as connectivity becomes embedded into stuff and environments, we think this can mean data and physical decisions are kind of more connected and calibrated. And that's really kind of what we're trying to do at Provenance. So we're talking about stuff, right? Mostly dumb stuff, I guess, like genes. They're not like that smart. Um, but they've got like loads of digital information. So they've got, they've got this like vast digital shadow, we kind of call it. Um, part of the problem is you only really see a kind of sl tiny slice of this big pie. You only really see the advertising, the price comparison sites, perhaps if you Amazon reviews, whatever. You know, maybe some celebrities wearing some jeans, but you don't really see the whole big picture, which is big supply chain data, loads of stuff about the bill of materials, social conditions, tons of documentation that actually make up this whole data shadow of this one 
seemingly uh, dumb object. Um, and currently, this this data is completely unlinked with this object as well, unless you know you're going to fuss around with using your phone on the barcode, which I personally think isn't really an eloquent design solution. So yeah, stuff is dumb, and the design experience of getting information from dumb stuff isn't great. But we think things are going to become less dumb, and environments around things are going to become smarter. So we're kind of basically gearing up for that. We're kind of getting ready um, and trying to put all our data in a row in order to get ready for the time when things become slightly less dumb and environments become slightly more responsive. Because we hope that in a world like that, price and perceived brand value and perhaps a bit of function won't be the only metrics with which you do your shopping. We hope you might start to do your shopping by other metrics, such as uh, how much energy you've contributed through buying uh, a product and other things like was it made by a slave or not. So, essentially what we're trying to say is we think the Internet of Things can change the environment and mechanics of choice, basically. Our choice architectures could hopefully reflect our choices as a society and not just as an individual. Um, a question that was posed in the New Scientist that kind of felt to me quite apt for what Providence is trying to do is, the question is how to enable rational and ethical behaviour in a world too complex for applied rationality. How to make our ignorance an opportunity for continual learning and adjustment. Yes, we are ignorant to a lot of things, but we can bring data into environments and hopefully help them kind of calibrate our, our behaviour. So how might this happen? Um, augmented reality has been quite interesting to me for a while. I mean, I think yeah, it's just, you know, it hasn't really been a thing until maybe glass. I feel like glass kind of semi-made us think, okay, maybe it's not a total nightmare to get out your phone and kind of look at a, a filter on our world. Um, but I, I mean, they still look terrible, so I don't know, we're not quite there yet. Um, but I think with glass, something I really made me realise is, oh my god, do I want to see the world according to Google? Really? I, I don't think so. Like, information curation is incredibly important, and who's in control of the information that you're looking through to see the world is also incredibly important. And I think this is something that really I'm quite up for discussing with all of you guys. I think it's an incredibly important debate that we need to work on sooner rather than later before we are all wearing glass. So, I mean, glass kind of takes me on to kind of think about stuff like quantified self, right? We're measuring things. Any of you that don't know much about quantified self, you can go talk to Matt because he's writing about it at the moment. Um, but, we, you know, I think something that Providence is really kind of keen to investigate and, and discuss is, is who's brokering your data? Like, who is owning this? Like, yeah, you're using a night fuel band every day and you can access your particular part of that data through a heavily controlled app that doesn't really have any kind of API that you can integrate with. But this data is all being owned by Nike. And do we want to be able to own that data or not? And how, moving forward, might we be able to act on that data better? I mean, we aren't working in quantified self. We're actually working in what we call quantified stuff. So it's where we start to, to see our metrics and measuring of our own personal consumption be kind of uh, filtered out into our world of objects. So not just measuring our own heart rate and our own, um, I don't know, weight on our wifing scales, but also measuring the, you know, the embodied energy of all the things we own and how much we're sharing those things, our own personal kind of energy footprints of our, of our stuff. So the Quantified Stuff movement has, um, has already kicked off quite a bit. There's quite a few projects. I'm just going to talk you through a few just because um, I think they're quite interesting. Um, things like this, adding Facebook likes to dresses and, and shirts and clothes, quite interesting. You know, brokering social media into a retail space isn't anything crazy. This um, project is quite interesting to me. Um, it's a kind of design approach to a data problem. Um, this is a project by Richard Gilbert, who is at um, the Royal College of Art. I think it's a couple of years old, actually. Um, but he designed three lamps with a kind of prerequisite um, embodied energy. So rather than measuring embodied energy post-creation uh, of something, he said, right, I'm going to make a lamp that's one megajoule. And this is the one megajoule lamp. Turns out concrete. It's got an incredibly low embodied energy. Um, and then this is the 10 megajoule lamp, got some wood and I don't know actually what the top's made of. Um, and then a 20 megajoule lamp which kind of embraces things like cork, we've still got the concrete stand and some wood. Um, but just quite an interesting attitude to think about how perhaps in the future, in a kind of quantified stuff world, we might just start to think about different parts of our things that we own. Um, I also, because I'm a bit of a data geek, occasionally like go shopping and look at uh, the shopping list I've got in several different stores and try and kind of calculate the different kinds of carbon savings by going to one store versus <laughs> another store, which is really 
actually does do this. Yeah, actually, <laughs> I just think it's really interesting. On one road, and you can save like basically no money. So the money difference is like pence. Buying three things like raspberries, apples, and a yogurt or something. Like just by going into one shop versus another shop. I mean, firstly, that shopping list I worked out on one street. You could possibly buy all those different things from 27 different countries. So that's just like, whoa, that's crazy. And then if you add up all the like carbon difference between the different constituent things you buy, it's basically the equivalent of 5.4 kilograms of CO2. So it's basically taking a massive ream of 200 sheets of A4 paper and just throwing it in the bin, just from like buying a few things at the shop. So I know that's not like a mega amount, but aggregated over everyone doing their shopping, this kind of quantified stuff starts to not seem quite so silly. So what we're doing at Providence, so when you, um, and we're just kind of trying to get the discussion going, I guess, a bit on this stuff, like where things come from, uh, how we can append that to dumb objects and smart objects, and think about that um, moving forward with the Internet of Things. But we are building something ourselves, so we're based at the Open Data Institute, and what we're building is initially um, a web platform, um, so we're not in the world of hardware quite yet, although I do do some experiments. Um, so we use open data, we believe in open data in quite a big way, and we think um, if we're really going to crack this like, transparency problem, it's, it's sort of the, the only way um, of kind of combating greenwash. So one of our kind of key open data uh, partners, and we've got several of those, one is Source Map, so they do open source mapping of supply chains. So we just like grab their API and match it with a product, and then we grab the API of another thing and match it with that same product. So like uh, open corporates that are also based at the Open Data Institute. So they've got a nice API that shows you, um, you know, all the different kind of financial information. And perhaps when you're buying something, financial geography is quite interesting to you if you want to support uh, something that was made locally or was uh, will uh, kind of financially benefit your local community rather than another one. So essentially, that's what we're doing. We're, we're aggregating open data streams or trying to get people to open their data streams up to us in order to um, give people some more interesting metrics to go shopping with online. So currently, if you want to buy some clothes, for example, you, you're pretty much only going to browse colour, size, you know, a few other normal bits and bobs. And, and what we're trying to kind of inject um, some new metrics, like uh, where something was made, by who, and what. So, at the moment, we're, like I say, we're building a web platform. And we're trying to make the data completely invisible, because I think people don't really want to look at supply chains. I mean, I do, but I don't think anyone else does. So essentially, we are trying to make it look just like a normal kind of shopping portal in order to trick people into using uh, open data to um, slightly maybe recalibrate their kind of shopping habits. Um, so this is sort of what it looks like right now, trying to make the data not too obvious. Um, so although Providence is quite young, I have been working on transparency of information um, and data for quite a long time and including doing my own augmented reality experiment, which was called Open Object, which allowed um, any kind of data to be appended to any kind of brand logo. So this was actually a project I did um, a couple of years ago, and definitely highlighted to me the fact that people don't really use their smartphones when they're in shops, uh, on the whole. Um, so that's why I was sort of trying to move away from that and, and kind of set ourselves up for a, a kind of more connected world, I guess. Um, but this, what's kind of interesting about what Open Object was trying to do compared to what Providence was trying to do is um, Open Object wasn't voluntary. So I was just scraping data and matching it to brand logos. And it was mostly negative stuff. It was mostly kind of newspaper articles about horrible beauty brands doing terrible stuff to animals. So I made loads of enemies, um, <laughs> which I thought, okay, I'm going to just stop this now. Um, after a few bad emails, I thought, okay, right. Uh, time to think of something else. And also I kind of realised, well, it's all very well like slating all these brands and augmented reality, but um, it's probably you know, not a great thing if people can't find an alternative. Um, so hence why I started Providence. So Providence is a platform for voluntary transparency. So the idea is that we actually use transparency as a unique selling point. We help people um, sign up and, and open up their data and, and see that as a kind of unique selling point. Hence why um, a lot of our initial maker users that are working with us in developing the site are making things in Europe, usually. So I've also done quite a lot of experiments in kind of changing retail environments, so kind of bringing data into physical spaces, um, things like being able to calibrate um, your opinion at home on your phone when you're relaxed and you're not really thinking about the hecticness of Tesco, and then going into a shop environment created by me with 
max MSP and some projectors, um, and kind of using those pre kind of calibrated uh, information preferences to kind of dictate the environment. So I'm quite interested to do more experiments like this as we accrue more and more data. So definitely interested to talk to people that are interested in creating smart environments or smart kind of object markers and stuff. Um, yeah, so transparency as a unique selling point is really the angle we're going for, and it's, it's proving to be actually very popular. Things like the kind of Bangladesh garment manufacturing collapse uh, earlier this year has meant a lot of brands that are making things in a good way really want to come out and shout about it, and they want to be open about it, which is great because it's giving us those data, which is cool. Um, yeah, so that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to get kind of brands and makers um, to become transparent to consumers, meaning companies that are kind of good, um, or at least open, open I think is the key thing, open and honest to kind of float it um, to the top. Um, yeah, so please, you know, get in touch with us, we, we, this is a discussion, we're very early stage, we're all kind of very passionate about this stuff, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, really interested to have some kind of thoughts from people in the IoT space as to how this might roll out in the future, relationship between augmented reality, dumb things, how dumb things might become smart. Cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
sign up for the site if you're interested. Yeah, sign up for the site and we'll, um, we'll keep you posted. And, come. and there was a question from Michael over there in the brown shirt. Right, hi there, thanks very much for that. Um, enjoyed it a lot and very interested. Um, you showed a sort of website, this is what it sort of looks like at the moment, but we can't see that yet. Can we see that soon? And yeah. what are the what are the sort of main challenges you guys face in here? So many. How um, <laughs> yeah, we're so we're gonna launch um, we're doing like a closed kind of beta with some makers and some customers um, in set, kind of end of September and then we're hoping kind of after that we'll we'll see how that goes basically. But yeah, we're kind of hoping end of October to have something live that people can sign up to. Um, so yeah, that's that. And yeah, lots of big challenges. I think w one interesting one is it polarises makers quite hugely. Like a lot of people make stuff in the UK and they just want to shout about it and they're really happy and it's like, great, yeah, I really need some kind of verification, but all of these stamps and seals don't really work and yeah, I really want to expose my supply chain and perhaps they've even tried to do a kind of Patagonia style supply chain thing in Flash or something. So they're like, yes, great, sign us up. But then there's also this kind of other, kind of older establishment kind of, yeah. that are really scared about open data. They're scared that it's a kind of, going to threaten their business and even though we're saying okay if, it's, if you, you know a factory address is a serious like uh, you know competitor advantage for you we can kind of mask that that's fine they're still just very nervous about what open data and transparency really means and, and whether it's actually just going to wreck their business because big manufacturers will just come and start using their suppliers etc so I think which yeah I guess we don't really know yeah. it, what that mean you know if that is true and, and so I was just kind of testing and trying it with people that are up for it and seeing what happens but yeah I think that is a big, yeah. big Ed education is a big challenge because yeah. you've got people who love it and embrace it and being the ADI it was some people who love this and embrace this yeah. uh, as we go and meet makers we get people who uh, just sort of recall in horror the idea of telling everybody where they make things because mm. even though they're made here their sort of prized possessions have the contracts they've secured with their makers yeah. um, and also on a consumer level lots of people don't know how much is made here lots of people don't know the variety of stuff that's made in the UK even in London there's about I've met about 60 people in London 60 companies in London who make amazing things yeah. um, and most people don't know that most people don't know that some of the idea behind the site is that if you log onto our website in London the site well, yeah. The screen you saw that rearranged itself like a shop window for things around you. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you can shop locally. Yeah, the, de the default view is the things that are made the closest to where you are when you open the site. Are, mm -hmm. That's the default product. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to kind of get people to get that idea of where stuff's made from the get-go. Yeah. yeah, designing so, that so it's kind of just looks like a normal shop yeah. site, but it's smarter, it's tricky. Because there, there is a company who's tried this already called Honest Buy, and it's run by a guy called Bruno Peters, who was the next designer of Hugo Boss. But what they did, they just listed all the data in a big text document below a pair of jeans. And for the average consumer, that's just like, what am I going to do with that? And how is that, what's important to me and what's not important? And so for us, one of the big challenges is finding the sweet spot for the consumer, but also for the maker. How much information does the consumer want to know, and how much does the maker want to give away? So that's so it's not so transparent after all. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is what we're trying to work out. So uh, Gavin, our sort of doyen of openness, said uh, very famous. He <laughs> <laughs> yeah. said very famously, there's no such thing as half semi-open or semi-closed. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to <laughs> tentatively, <laughs> yeah, tentatively okay. push on to make us to say, if you're going to yeah. be open, go. No, we're all about the open, but it's a mission, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. But it's a lot of I think. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Sorry, there's one more. Sorry, there's one. No more hands going up. Okay, so two, and then the third one. Okay, three more questions. Okay, three more questions. And I think, okay. I think then it might be pub time actually. So, is it? Sorry, is it over there, Bruce first? Can do. Yes. Uh, so, I suppose so. You're dealing a lot with makers who are worried about stuff, but do the makers actually know what the provenance is of the stuff that they're getting? Yes. And it, is yeah. it possible to actually solve it at that level? Yeah. Rather than yeah. necessarily at the consumer level. Yeah, so yeah. small small makers, we, we chose small makers because they're very close to their, to their supply chains. Uh, and it's kind of a, most of the people who we speak to actually set up their supply chains themselves. So they have a very intimate knowledge of where the things come from. Um, but also because they're so close to it, they feel as though it's something that's taken a long time to develop. And so the idea of telling a company who makes the same thing where to go and get exquisitely made <coughs> leather from is 
downside. What, 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 what about bigger makers? I know you mentioned Unilever. Well, so there's lots of companies, so it's kind of like a... I think, I mean, companies already do. So Nike opened up all their list of suppliers, right, online. You can go and you can see every single supplier that Nike uses, which is really interesting. And I think other companies want to do the same thing, but maybe they don't have... But essentially, we're making a quick way for them to do that. If they want to do the night thing, we can just do it with us and we'll <coughs> help them and do it for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of companies, like, I don't know if any of you read, there's an article um, in the Telegraph on Sunday that was about uh, Unilever supply chain and their palm oil suppliers. They have no idea who any of them are, and it's just a huge like disconnect. And I think what we are trying to do is it's going to be very difficult for them to find out every single different supplier. But this is, I mean, the premise of open data is this becomes a bit more collaborative and we try and kind of work with them and we try and get them to slowly open things up and hopefully put pressure on the holes, you know, so start to see, hold on, you've got this massive gaping hole and all your consumers can see that if yeah. they're on our site. So, yeah, we're hoping it will try and... Yeah. I think it's a problem Joe touched on with the, the way this, your systems were built was not really for human sort of eyes um, and supply chains have gone that way. Supply chains have gone incredibly yeah, complicated. Horrific. And the data is buried in reams and reams and reams of things that most people don't take the time to look at and don't revise that often either. If it works, leave it alone. So for us, it's the idea of saying, hey, why don't we look at these all these data sets and trying to find a way of sort of gently encouraging them to do it. Because what we found is fear with big business doesn't work. You try and scare them into doing it, they close the job or they disappear. Uh, mm -hmm. But so, the thing is that it doesn't work often as well, that's the yeah. thing. Like with Unilever, their palm oil suppliers is like a disaster. You know, yeah. They've had to cut away all the smaller smaller suppliers, and now they're just using these big, like horrible, I mean, it's a, it's a mess. So, you know, if they can do it, and they can do it publicly, and they can make a cool PR story about it, it, it seems to me yeah. like you know, it might happen. Okay. So there was another question from over there, and there was, oh, I totally forgot the last person, sorry. Uh, <laughs> there, yeah, there they are. Ivan? Chris. Chris, yeah, yeah. Uh, I work with small designers and local Maybe. manufacturers. So oh, cool. um, my company's called Makers. And, uh, <laughs> hey! <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I, I think that the people I work with will have some worries about that yeah. aspect, yeah. but I'm sure it can be got over because it's also one of their USBs that mm. is locally manufactured. Are you going to be a sort of activist NGO? Or are you a for profit company? or? How do you get paid? Well, yeah, this is the big question. Um, I think we're gonna, we've sort of decided we're going to be like a social enterprise. We're going to kind of go down the traditional kind of shopping route, actually, which is sort of, I don't know if you know, there's quite a few like e-commerce sites like Supply, and they make money through affiliate links. So I think, actually, we might just start by doing something like that, so making just a percentage of directing sales, so that we actually do become just a shopping site, it's just we're a bit smarter. I feel like that might be the best route to go, but we've also talked a lot about doing a kind of freemium, kind of transparency model, but I don't know, it, it's, it's, if anyone has any ideas, yeah. we, we found, we found, <laughs> <laughs> we found a, so going down the NGO route, we found yeah. being the ODI and listening to other companies' experiences doing governments, it's a nightmare, and it's ridiculously convoluted, and there's lots of wormholes and rabbit holes and places you want to go in. We found that the best way to empower change is through people's stuff. If you yeah. buy stuff that makes a difference, and it's effortless, and it, you're sort of getting a tick in a kind of conscious consumerism box without even noticing, then that's the that most powerful way well, to it. Yeah, I mean, it'd be nice to, I kind of feel like it'd be nice to start as a business and try and do this. <coughs> like, I, you know, the ethical consumer market is what? It's like seven billion pounds in the UK or something ridiculous. So I think there is appetite, and it maybe it won't be quite as, you know, all embracing as we obviously want it to be, but if, it, if this can make money as a business, and that would be cool, I think. Uh, all right, and there's just a last question from lady over there. Sorry, don't you name? Julia. I was just wondering, um, you know how you say about Google Glass mm -hmm. and how it was bad because it was dictating the way that you see the world through Google? It's just well, my personal opinion. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so you, you're sort of in, like, how ethical do you think you actually are? Because you're automatically yeah. dictating like these choices are good choices, and you're only offering a certain limited number of ones that are these transparent. And you kind of define what's good within the transparency thing. Sorry. Yeah, no, good, good question. Really good question. Because I think actually I shouldn't really say good ever. Because we kind of ban the words like sustainable, ethical, good. Because we aren't any of those things. Like, buying nothing is better. Definitely, no doubt. And actually buying from us or going through our metrics isn't necessarily the best thing either. 
But I think what we're really just trying to do is open everything up. Like we want everything to be based on open data, we want everything to be accessible to everyone. So it's no like rating that we've given a product that's based on mm -hmm. some scientists doing some research on some supply chains that you can't access. Like every single thing we're doing is open. So essentially I'm hoping that means that everything can be questioned and it's not us really dictating a view. Because you can contribute to it too. If you want to flag something in a supply chain and you don't think it's right, then you can. I think we're just trying to kind of broker that conversation and, and hopefully add more data to the bigger picture. So with your Google Glass, you can look at the supermarket and you can pick Google's view if you want, and you can look at prices and stuff that's paid for more advertising. Or you could look at another view, which might be about embodied energy of every product in this store. It might be, and we're not saying that everything we're doing is correct and every single piece of data is right because that would be a nightmare if we had to verify all that stuff. So just by hopefully making it open, we kind of means we're less responsible, but it also means we're all responsible, which is kind of cool, hopefully. But yeah, I mean, it's early stages and yeah, I don't think we claim to be like ethical or quite yet. All right, other questions? Everything cool. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You.